in order to understand the computational processes that give rise to things like complex learned algorithmic behaviors like driving or playing chess or solving a Rube cube or even language speaking to each other we need to have some way of reasoning about how knowledge accumulates across people hey there i'm your host kan jun and we are generally intelligent an independent research lab developing AI agents that mirror the fundamentals of human-like intelligence and that can learn to safely solve problems in the real world. On our podcast, we interview researchers about their behind-the-scenes ideas, opinions, and intuitions that are hard to share in papers and talks. We hope you learn as much as we have in our quest to understand and build the mind. Bill Thompson is a cognitive scientist and assistant professor at UC Berkeley. He runs an experimental cognition laboratory where he and his students conduct research on human language and cognition using large-scale behavioral experiments, computational modeling, and machine learning. I'm really excited to have you on the podcast, Bill. And you're our second psychologist, so we haven't had many psychologists. And your work is super interesting, covering kind of a whole swath of language, evolution, culture, and cognition, and computation. I'm curious, like, where did you start, and how did you develop your initial research interests? Yeah, so I was a psychology undergraduate student, and I always wanted to be a clinical psychologist. Oh. So a lot of psychology students want to be in clinical psychology or social psychology. And I took a class in psycholinguistics. Psycholinguistics is kind of like the intersection of psychology and linguistics. And one of the lectures was on language evolution. It was kind of a random lecture for the course, normally come up in psycholinguistics classes. Mm -hmm. But I just absolutely loved the topic. I was absolutely fascinated by this question of where language comes from and why we seem to be the only species that has anything as rich in terms of our communication system as language is. Yeah, so I became very interested in the topic of language evolution and then went on to do a master's degree. I was heavily focused around that topic. Yeah, so that's, that's how I got started. I was not a particularly good undergraduate student. I didn't have research experience or great grades or anything. I was very lucky to get accepted onto the language evolution master's program at Edinburgh University. Yeah, so that's where I got started. I did the master's degree and then things just went from there. What was it about language evolution that was so interesting to you? So one reason language evolution is so interesting is because it's seen by some as one of the major events of the evolution of life on Earth. So language obviously seems very familiar to us and we use it kind of effortlessly and Almost everybody learns a language or more than a lang one language, but almost no other species has anything like this richer communication system mm. to the extent that people call it one of the major transitions in the evolution of life on earth, the emergence of language in our species. It enables all this other stuff. So languages enable all sorts of other like mechanisms for information transmission that then create a process that has led to the complexity we see today in mm. societies and cognition. So the scope of the question is one reason I found language evolution so interesting. And also it being so interdisciplinary. So in order to understand the phenomenon like that, you need perspectives from psychology, linguistics, evolutionary biology, and these days computer science to build models of the process too. Mm, that makes sense. And so when you went into your graduate program, what research areas were you interested in at that time? So I did a master's degree in the UK, and they're generally taught master's degrees. And it, mine was a taught master's degree too, so I was just taking courses. And I took a course called Simulating Language. So at that point, I hadn't really had much experience with programming or math, just kind of what you get as a psychology student. And then this class, Simulating Language, blew my mind. I couldn't believe that this was a way you could do cognitive science. It taught us to use agent-based simulations to study the processes of how language changes over time and yeah, knowledge is transmitted between agents in a multi-agent setting. So at the time it was just simple agent-based simulations, but it was this entire world of methods you can use to study those sorts of processes that I, I was really blown away by. And ever since I've been trying to learn, like orient my entire life around learning more and more computational methods to answer questions about how knowledge is transmitted from person to person. Mm, interesting. And so when you went into your PhD program, was that the focus? Like try to use computational methods to understand how knowledge is transmitted? Yeah, my PhD advisor was the professor who taught the simulating language class that introduced me to those methods. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, the PhD was about using computational models, probabilistic models of inference and optimization methods to understand how languages evolve and how, in particular, I studied how evolutionary processes interact with learning processes. At some point, I found this paper, actually by Jeff Hinton, who's now known for, really well known for a totally different work. Mm -hmm. But it was a paper from 19 called How Learning Guides Evolution, Hinton and I think Steve Nolan. It was a really simple simulation. So they studied what's sometimes called genetic assimilation, sometimes called canalization, also called the Baldwin effect sometimes. But it was one of the first simulations of that process. The insight from the model is that if you have an evolutionary process that's adapting some sort of like genetic representation to an environment, that if you add the possibility for learning so that the genetic process can specify learning rather than like hard-coded stuff about the environment, then you get a completely different kind of process. You get this much richer evolutionary process with really interesting dynamics. So yeah, I was really interested in that idea and started learning some of the math you need to do evolutionary dynamics and integrating that with probabilistic models of cognition. And my PhD ended up being about this class of modeling frameworks that integrate evolutionary dynamics and computation. That was where I got started. And so can you tell me about kind of when you were first thinking about this class of modeling frameworks and, and thinking about what problem you were working on, how did you find the problem you were working on and how would you describe it? The reason that that class of models is so interesting is because there's this kind of tension around innateness and learning that has been part of debates around evolution for a long time, where on the one hand, especially for species like ours, you have this incredible plasticity. We're able to learn all sorts of different stuff. They have incredible plasticity in learning. But on the other hand, something like language seems to be, certainly have some sort of genetic basis or biological basis and is universal in the species. So it appears everywhere. No matter where you grow up, you learn a language. It clearly has some biological basis. Mm -hmm. So reconciling those two things is kind of difficult. How do you have something that's biologically evolved, but also incredibly flexible? Yeah, so what's interesting about this class of models that combine evolution and learning is that you can start to account for those sorts of trade-offs and that those sorts of like seeming paradoxes. So I worked on models of how priors in Bayesian models of learning evolve biologically to support flexible learning systems. Mm -hmm. I see. Interesting. It sounds like you primarily use this class of Bayesian models. Were there any other types of models that you also explored? Yeah, one of the things I enjoyed most about those projects was being able to integrate different classes of models. Mm, what covers? Yeah, so in particular, the replicated dynamics and evolution. So there's really interesting connections that I've since learned about between evolution, inference, and optimization. You have equivalences between evolutionary processes, like the replicated dynamics, yeah. and Bayesian inference. So the clearest place to see that is in generation structured evolutionary processes and Bayesian inference over discrete hypotheses. And then you also have this connection between Bayesian inference and optimization. So it's really been so exciting over the last few years to see progress in making these connections. So one of the places we find equivalence that's insightful, at least I think so, is that a stochastic gradient descent can be seen as a form of Bayesian inference where there's some relationship between the starting conditions of the optimization process and the prior in Bayesian inference. Oh. Yeah, it's really cool. And the stopping rule for your optimization process and regularization in Bayesian inference. Oh, that's really interesting. Can you explain how the connection works? Yeah, there's a few different ways to think about those connections. But an intuitive way is, imagine you th think about your initialization of an optimization process for something like a neural network, mm -hmm. where you have a parameter base that you want to optimize and you, you initialize it somehow. <laughs> And then as the optimization process continues, you get further away from the initial conditions and mm. closer to something implied by the data that your objective function is defined over. Mm. And if you imagine the initial conditions as, as something related to a prior distribution and whatever your optimization objective is, is related to a likelihood function for the data, mm. then interpolating between the prior and the data mm -hmm. kind of what you, is what, what you really do in learning. And the point at which you stop the optimization process, I don't remember the details here, but somehow related to the strength of the prior distribution, or the, kind of the variance that's in the implicit prior distribution. Oh, well, that's interesting. So it's kind of like, I really like this idea of SGD as interpolating between the prior and the data. 
Yeah. Um, and like I can see, okay, the point at which you stop means, you know, if you stop earlier, then the prior distribution is maybe much stronger in the final result or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the intuition. So I should be clear, this is not my work. This is just stuff I like to read. But that's only one of the connections between inference and optimization, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the second part of the triangle. Mm -hmm. and you can also close the triangle between optimization and evolution. Mm -hmm. So there's a way of thinking about the replicator dynamics. This is the part I remember least well. There's a way of thinking about the replicator dynamics as gradient descent on something, some optimization objective that has to do with the fitness calculations in the, the replicator model. Interesting. Yeah. So you have these three ways of thinking about uh, complex processes of like complex adaptive processes, uh, optimization, evolution, and inference. And you can draw connection between all three and yeah, kind of interpolate between those models. Some of them have each class of modeling paradigm has its particularly useful for some settings and right. uh, uh, yeah, interpolating between them is something that would be quite powerful, I think. It's really interesting. So I guess the claim here would be something like evolution, inference, and optimization are somewhat isomorphic. Like you can draw some isomorphisms between the processes, even though they seem like they have like different, goal, like different goals or different structures or something like that. Yeah, that's what people are most interested in, I think. So the nuance is that there are relationships between the math that we use to study these processes, the extension of the, uh, uh, like, whether the relationships are a result of the simplifications that we use uh... to math is something you can think about. That's a little beyond my expertise, but certainly like reasoning about those three sorts of processes when seen in combination, I find really, really helpful. And so you were interested in kind of this question about innateness versus learning and using models in order to be able to kind of disentangle the two. When you did the work during your PhD, like what work would you say explored this distinction? The work I was most satisfied by or kind of grateful to be able to, to contribute to a series of really simple mathematical models. Mm -hmm. So the setup there was that you have a population of rational agents trying to coordinate. So it was in the context of language evolution that's seen as an important goal. Agents coordinate on the behaviors that they learn and that each agent has a prior distribution that kind of implies something about where they start and then goes out and learns from the generation before them. The math we developed allowed us to study those sorts of processes with some new results that were kind of insightful, I thought. So by integrating those classes of models, what you're able to do is look at biological and cultural evolution in the same setting. The key result was that when you have both of those evolutionary processes in parallel, that the like fitness landscape in the biological process is much smoother than you would imagine when you don't have cultural evolution. So that allows you to move around really quickly. It allows you to adapt really fast by just making tiny tweaks in the biological space that are then kind of amplified by the cultural process. So the key result from these models is that the fitness landscape in the biological space becomes much smoother when you also account for cultural evolution. Yeah, that's the general idea. How did you set up the model so that you could draw this conclusion and kind of observe that the fitness landscape was much smoother? So we looked at how the prior evolves. That's the key. That, that's the kind of core thing we studied. When you turn off the cultural evolution part, whatever your kind of objective is for the agents, then that becomes reflected in the prior pretty strongly. So you get like gradual biological evolution of prior distribution that reflects the op optimization objective. No, no, no. But when you turn on the cultural evolutionary processes, it looks kind of different. So you'd, it's not gradual. It's generally like a small tweak in the right direction. And then learning and cultural transmission takes over that process and kind of amplifies those biases such that you don't need to do any further optimization in biological space. Ah, uh, that's really interesting. I see. So basically, if you have no cultural evolution between agents, then all of the fitness has to be captured by the biological prior. And so you mm. get like super open biological priors, whereas you get like much more general biological prior if you're able to do uh, cultural evolution. Precisely. Yeah. Um, so, And if the prior is general, it's kind of peaky enough to push you just enough in the right direction for the cultural process to get you where you need to be in the optimization process. Mm -hmm. But it's also not constraining. So if mm -hmm. suddenly you flip the optimization objective onto the traditional kind of like biological evolutionary process, it's really hard to switch. You know, it takes a long time to move from one, one prior to another. But when you have this kind of flatter 
less constraining prior, you can make those switches really quickly. So it leads to this kind of nimble adaptive process that wasn't anything like I'd ever really seen before in traditional models. That's interesting. Can you give me some intuition for what does it mean for it to be able to flip easily? And is that what you mean by smoothness? Imagine your environment is in one state and mm -hmm. you're trying to adapt agents that produce behavior that's consistent with that state or delivers utility with that state. And you can either do that by designing a prior distribution or mm -hmm. inductive biases that are very constraining in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And that gives you robustness in the sense that like, you know, minor deviations from the, the prior distribution won't cause problems. But it also means you're kind of stuck in that space if the biological evolutionary process is slow. Mm -hmm. And then if your environment suddenly changes to a different state and therefore you need different behaviors, then it's hard to, for agents to adapt. I see. And so the kind of like the biological evolution, like priors move very gradually. Whereas when you say flip, you mean that when the environment changes, then immediately you can get these totally new behaviors that are adapted because of the cultural evolution. Yeah, precisely. Exactly. Yeah. Can you remember like what kind of environment changes did you instate at that time? Oh, really simple stuff. So those models were just like A over B type models mm -hmm. where you, your agents are adapting to simple discrete sets of states. Mm -hmm. environment. Yeah, so there's a lot of complexity that we tend to think about now that we just didn't think about at all in those models. That makes sense. That's really interesting. And so from that work, like throughout the rest of your PhD, what were some of the other things that you kind of were exploring or you felt like were interesting results or your postdoc? Yeah. Working on those models kind of convinced me of the importance of cultural evolution mm. and what an interesting process it, it is. So as a postdoc, one of the things I've done is focus on trying to study cultural evolution experimentally. So I really like these classes of mathematical models that I used in my PhD. But recently, it's become possible to study cultural evolution experimentally in ways that were quite difficult until quite recently. So as a postdoc, you were trying to study cultural evolution more experimentally. How did you go about doing that? Like, what was the thinking behind it? So traditionally in psychology, the way we, we work is by bringing people into the lab and giving them tasks that we're interested in and manipulating things and seeing how people perform. And generally, that's, at least historically, that's been something you do with a small number of people, mm -hmm. you know, a handful of people. In recent years, one thing that's happened is that we're able to recruit people at a much larger scale using online data collection. So there are a number of ways in which that has changed psychology and cognitive science. But one of the ways is that it's allowed us to start running experiments that have a more complex structure. So as well as just recruiting more people and more diverse people online, it also allows you to start building experiments that do have kind of qualitatively different designs. And part of that is creating designs where people are in networks. So yeah, for example, you can recruit people online to do a task, say hundred people do a task, mm -hmm. and then they respond to the task and give you the data. And then once they are finished, you can recruit more people who come into the task and transmit the results of the previous set of people to the new set of people and control that process algorithmically. Yeah. So one of my postdoc mentors, Tom Griffiths, has this way of describing that way of thinking about experimental design as, as thinking about experimental design as algorithm design. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so those sorts of tools allow us to create experiments that recreate aspects of cultural evolution in the laboratory. So basically you would bring people in to do some tasks and then there would be some transmission algorithm that you're testing. And so in this situation, are you evaluating kind of the impact of different transmission algorithms to the next group or what kinds of questions do you, do you want to have with the setup? All of those questions. Yeah. So one line of research we have in my lab is, is about studying how people choose who to learn from. So there's an analogous set of questions in studying how people choose who to learn from and how that influences the process of the transmission of knowledge across time. But you can also think about that same process of selecting who to learn from and controlling the transmission of knowledge through a population mm -hmm. as something you can control algorithmically and then design algorithms that support or that are better attuned to different objectives. So I work on both of those things. First thing is more theoretical and help us understand why human social learning is so powerful and what it is about human social cognition that allows us to accumulate complex conceptual systems mm -hmm. over time 
So that's something I'm very interested in. Yeah. Uh, but also, analogously, as you say, you can think about that process as a computational process. So there's a bunch of theory developing around that analogy, but it also leads to things you can do that are quite practical. So we've been designing algorithms that support the integration of knowledge in social networks, for example, and seeing those as yeah design problems that you can reason about mathematically and then test in these sorts of large scale experiments. That's so interesting. So I know that one of the papers that you worked on or one of the experiments you worked on was transmission of a human's ability to, I think, understand a sorting algorithm. Mm and kind of transmit that algorithm over time. Can you explain the setup and also what you ended up learning? Yeah, I'd be delighted. I'd say that's probably the work that I spent most time on until we started working on social networking algorithms. So for context, one of the things we're really interested in is how people discover complex cognitive objects. Things like aspects of language, processes of reasoning, counting, navigating, planning, those sorts of behaviors all involve what you can think about as cognitive algorithms, mm -hmm. structured mental operations that if you weren't taught how to do them, it'd be extremely unlikely that you would figure it out on your own. But somehow, mm -hmm. as a cultural and social species, the first thing you do in life is acquire all this structured, this rich, structured cognition. Yeah, so that was the kind of motivating idea for that experiment. And the task that we ended up using was one that's underlyingly a uh, sorting task. So <laughs> you've gone kind of straight to the conclusion about the sorting, but I'll try and present it in a way that leads to the conclusion. Here's how we explain the test to participants. So suppose I lay six images in front of you on the table, and I tell you that the images are ordered from one to six, each image is uniquely numbered, mm -hmm. and that your goal is to try and put them in order. The order of the images has nothing to do with the content. And all you can do is choose any two. And if they're in order, relatively, I'll swap them for you. And if they're out of order, then they'll stay where they are. So the goal is to make comparisons such that at the end of your sequence of comparisons, they're in order. And then when you think they're in order, you press finish. And if they're in the correct order, we'll pay you. Ah, it, it, so this is an important detail. So if they're in the correct order, we'll pay you mm -hmm. a reward. And the reward that you'll get is proportional to the number of comparisons you made. Oh, interesting. Inversely proportional. So mm -hmm. if you can establish the correct order with like a few comparisons, then the reward that you'll get is larger than the reward that you'll get if you use more comparisons. So that's the basic task. Underlyingly, it's a sorting problem, as you identified immediately. But if you haven't studied computer science, that's not so clear. So, or it can, you know, you might not necessarily know the algorithms you can use to solve those sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. So specifically, I think it's a comparison exchange sorting problem. What does that mean, comparison exchange? Uh, it means that you can compare items and then exchange them if they're in the wrong order. Ah, got it. Yeah, compression. I think that's what it's called. <laughs> yeah, so we really like this task because it's simple enough to explain. It's not a super fun game, but it is a kind of a game. <laughs> and you can feels, especially when you do it in person, it kind of feels like a magic trick of some sort. But it's also a very richly structured problem. So you can imagine trying to solve it through something quite straightforward. So just comparing every image to the image next to it and just doing that a few times and then seeing if it works. But there are also, turns out, really structured, efficient algorithms that solve the problem um, that have been developed in computer science. Mm -hmm. So underlyingly, it's this problem that has a rich base of algorithmically structured solutions. Mm. And what we're interested in is, is what people do intuitively, how mm. people solve that problem and how that compares to the algorithms that computer scientists have designed. Mm -hmm. And so what did you discover? Well, a few things. So the first thing to say is that people are not particularly good at the problem on their own. <laughs> mm. So it's a hard problem. It takes a few few goes at the test just to kind of figure out what you're doing. But yeah, so most people don't figure out a good solution initially. Mm -hmm. And a good solution means finding the correct order with a small number of comparisons. Would they find kind of quote unquote bad solutions? Like they would end up finding the correct order, but it would took a large number of comparisons yeah. or that they couldn't even find the, the correct order? Uh, some of both. So some people just found it frustrating and couldn't figure out what to do and just kind of didn't, didn't even bother. Mm -hmm. But most people find solutions that are kind of like 
something like a random exhaustive search. <laughs> so you kind of just try stuff and see what happens and keep clicking pairs until everything stops moving. And then, you know, it's sorted. Uh, um, yeah. So they're the most intuitive or maybe the first thing you think of way to solve the problem. But then a small proportion of the population figures out that you can be a little more systematic. So it helps to be able to see when I, when I describe this, but I'll, I'll try and do it just through description. <laughs> so suppose you take the first image mm -hmm. and you compare it to the second, and then you compare the first and the third, and then the first and the fourth, and the first mm -hmm. and the fifth, and the first and the sixth. Mm -hmm. There are six images in this task. Mm -hmm. And then you take the second image, and you, you compare the second and the third, and the second and the fourth, and the second and the fifth, and the second and the sixth. Mm -hmm. And you go kind of down the line like that mm -hmm. until you've compared every image to all of the images to its right. So that's kind of systematic, and it solves the problem in exactly 15 comparisons. It's easy to, relatively easy to remember how to do it, and relatively easy to kind of generalize when you see someone else doing it. So mm -hmm. once you've seen me compare the first image to all the others, and then the second image to all the others, and then I move to the third one, you can kind of guess what I'm going to do. So at some point in that process of observation, people can generalize to the procedure as a whole. So a small number of people figure out something like that. And there's, a, there's some interesting stuff to say about how the algorithm compares to other algorithms. So, mm -hmm. so one thing to say is that it's just exhaustive comparisons. Mm -hmm. In the case of six images, 15 comparisons is all you need to compare all of them. And you could do those comparisons in any particular order, or at least there are multiple orders you could do the comparisons. But people really like to start from the left, and they really like to compare adjacent images before they huh. compare images that aren't adjacent. That's really interesting. Yeah. Why is that? Well, we don't really know. Like, there's uh, mappings between space and time. Left to right is kind of moving forward in the task. Is mm -hmm. one possibility. Uh -huh. I'd really like to look at this task in people who use writing systems that go in the other direction. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, like in Arabic. Yeah, precisely. So people have these kinds of biases that are about the construal of the task that don't really have, at least not all of them, have a reality in an algorithmic sense. So they aren't improving the efficiency of the solution. They're just kind of biases that mean things are easier to remember or easier to describe. Yeah, so that algorithm that I described is called selection sort in computer science. And an even smaller number of people, we haven't established the, the kind of like population frequency really precisely yet, but it's roughly one in 20, one in 30 people, I think, mm -hmm. discovers that you don't need to do all of those comparisons. So you can do something more efficient. You can chop out some of the redundant comparisons if you start in a certain place. Mm -hmm. So without going into detail at the moment, then one of the algorithms people figure out around one in, one in 20, one in 30 people is called gnome sort. Unfortunately, it's also known as, I think, stupid sort in computer science, which is a shame because it's not stupid at all. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's one of the, yeah, it's the kind of most impressive things that people discover in the task, um, mm -hmm. also by gnome sort. That's the kind of story when you treat it like a traditional psychology experiment, where you mm -hmm. have people engage with the task independently and just figure out the solution through what we might think of as reinforcement learning or uh, some other model of sequential decision making in this task. Mm -hmm. But the experiment gets more interesting when we take what the first set of people learned and then give that to another set of people. So say you have 15 people engage with the task and each of them figures out their own strategy, mm -hmm. and then they leave a description. They write down what they figured out, and they also leave a demonstration. They're at the end of the test, they're told, you know, thank you for engaging. Can you tell us what, you, what you've learned about this task and um, mm. write it down in a way that's helpful for other people? Can you demonstrate what you've learned in a way that will help another person in the task? Yeah, so the next group of people is then in a different situation because they have the insights of the first group of people to help them to frame how they think about the task. Mm -hmm. Wait, before we go on, did the first group get to try it multiple times or they could only, it was one shot? No, you get a few goes. So you get a few practice trials, I think three or four practice trials. Okay. And then 10 score trials where you're, oh. you're earning money each, each game. Got it. Okay. Got it. So there's plenty of iteration. Great. Mm. Exactly. And it turns out that giving people more and more trials doesn't really change too much what people discover. At least that's how it seems. That's very interesting. Okay. <laughs> There's some more nuance in that. So if you're going to discover a gnome sort, for example, the more complex algorithm, 
you'll probably do that within five or 10 trials. Right. And adding more trials isn't, isn't likely to substantially increase the, the probability that you'll discover that on your own. Mm, um, I see. Interesting. Yeah. We haven't studied that in a great amount of detail yet. I like to do that. But it, yeah, people kind of figure out a solution, normally the slightly mm-hmm. simpler solution, and then stick with that rather than innovating over time. Ah, interesting. Yeah. That's also very interesting. Yeah. Maybe that partly to do with the context of the task. You could probably design a version that would incentivize more innovation by individuals. But yeah, at least in this version of the task, what people discover in 10 trials is more or less what they'll discover with like 50 trials or so. I see. Interesting. So the interesting part is that when you, oh, the, another interesting part, I think, is that when you allow this process of transmission to go on for a few generations, you start to see interesting things. What we thought when we initially designed this experiment was that if we just allowed people to pass on what they'd learned mm-hmm. over generations, we repeat this transition process, like I think 12 times in this experiment. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one generation does a task and then passes on the knowledge to the next generation and they pass on their knowledge to the next we thought that over time, that process would lead to accumulation. The algorithms people are using become more and more powerful just through this process of the transmission of knowledge. And that's what it looked like when we started doing uh, simple pilots of this. this mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But part of the difficulty, part of what me- makes that process not work is that the more complex algorithms, the more efficient, more complex algorithms like GNOME so they're fairly rarely discovered. So if I randomly choose who to learn from at the previous generation, Mm. then chances are I won't choose someone who discovered one of these rare and more efficient algorithms. So they drop out, they get discovered. And the knowledge disappears. Precisely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you get this situation where someone discovers this really efficient, really like impressive algorithm, but then it disappears because they don't happen to have the necessary like descendants in the process to to keep it afloat. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So you started with random, and so then people didn't really, it seems like people did not, a higher percentage of people did not discover new algorithms. Yeah. So what the random process that we call random mixing, which is uh, like learning from a randomly sampled selection of people, mm-hmm. what that leads to is it removes the fraction of the population that does not find any solution. So almost everyone learns from someone who at least has one, learned from one person who's found a solution, even if it's only a, one of the lower performing algorithms. Mm-hmm. So everyone ends up using an algorithm that solves the task. So the way we think about that is that the process as a whole is optimizing for something like transmissibility, things that people are likely to discover. So they have a high base rate in the population mm-hmm. and that are easy to learn at the next generation tend to dominate the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the other thing to say about that is that if you, the proportion of people, so if you learn from someone who discovered a more complex algorithm, then you're less likely to acquire that algorithm than if you learn from someone who had a simpler algorithm. That's so interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So you have these two forces working against the accumulation of complexity. One is the rarity of discovery Mm -hmm. and one is the difficulty of transmission. Right. Um, And combined, they kind of conspire to make sure that the complex discoveries are not frequent in population over time. And so then I suppose a different mechanism would be instead of doing random mixing, you take the top performers and then transmit only those to the next generation. That's right, indeed. So that was exactly what we wanted to study. That was exactly the insight we had and an insight that's that's in a lot of the models that people have built of cultural evolution mathematical models mm-hmm. over the years. The models predict that if you have some process that prioritizes rare discoveries of high-performing innovations, mm-hmm. that that will keep them afloat over time. What we did was allow people to choose who they could learn from on the basis of how well they performed in the task. So instead of just getting a random sample of people to learn from, uh, mm-hmm. you could choose who you wanted to learn from, and you were told this person scored really highly. This person had a really a really high bonus in the in the experiment. Did anyone choose lower performing people? There's some evidence that people, so another detail I haven't mentioned actually is that we, people could choose to learn from three individuals. Okay. So there's some evidence that, this is not solid, this is not something we analyzed in detail in the, in the paper, but there's some suggestion that the people who perform best, I guess it's the same thing we already talked about, it's the people who perform best generally use something that's more complicated and therefore harder to learn. So you can imagine a situation where you think you find someone who got four, like the four 
reward in the task and you think, okay, I want to learn what this person knows. Mm-hmm. I want that reward too. I learn from them. But then you look at what they do and it's really complicated and mm. it's hard to learn. So you think, okay, well, let, let me try someone who might not have earned as much, but has a, a strategy that's easy, easier to acquire, mm-hmm. easier to understand. So we saw some evidence for that kind of thing going on. The other thing that's important is that you don't have everyone learn from the same person. So if everyone chooses the, the highest performing person to learn from, then a lot of the diversity in the population is lost. Because you can imagine a situation where like, the person who happens to score the most points in the game is not a particularly good teacher or you know, happened to give a, a bad description. So if everyone is choosing the same high scorer to learn from, but they're not a particularly helpful teacher, then the knowledge is lost. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So the one mechanism that we explored to get around that is choosing a subset of, so every individual at generation T plus one mm-hmm. gets a randomly sampled subset of the generation T mm-hmm. individuals to learn from. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So we don't, so not everyone sees the exact same set of people. I see. And so using this mechanism where people can choose who to learn from and they can choose to learn from higher scores, did you observe new behavior getting developed? Yeah, absolutely. So this mechanism that we call selective social learning provides a solution to those two problems. So the the problem that complex stuff is difficult to discover and difficult to pass on. Mm -hmm. So it, it just kind of increases the fraction of people who are exposed to the rarer discoveries. Mm-hmm. And you can work out the math of, uh, around these sorts of processes in terms of the proportion of people who are exposed to the rarer innovation and how hard it is to learn. Mm-hmm. So you need to find the sweet spot where you have enough people exposed to it and it's not too difficult to learn for the behavior to be maintained. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what we found. So by the end of like 10 or 12 generations of this process of selective social learning, over half of the population was using this algorithm known so that was really a rare discovery uh, among individuals. So if you had just done the standard psychology experiment, and one of the reasons we chose this is because problem solving is it's one of the oldest domains in psychology and artificial intelligence. Uh, and it's generally thought about as just a property of the minds, right? You give people a task, you let them think about it, and then... Right, but it turns out people are not very good at problem solving oh, yeah. <laughs> on their own. <laughs> yeah, <it's just, laughs> yeah, at least in this task. Yeah. So if you just look at what people do as individuals, you get one impression. You think Mm -hmm. people aren't good at this, people can't generally do it, we need something simpler to Mm -hmm. study. But if you allow this process of the accumulation of knowledge and of new concepts over time, by the end of that process, you get a completely different impression of people's cognitive abilities in this domain. Mm -hmm. So yeah, almost like, well, uh, over half the population ends up using an algorithm only one in 30 people would figure out if left to you, like if you didn't have access to this kind of social learning. Yeah, so that was the main result. Did anyone discover anything more efficient than gnome sort? That's a really interesting question. Because of the constraints on the task, because there are only six images, we could work out the optimal algorithm. Mm-hmm. Uh, or it turns out there's not one optimal algorithm. There's a class of programs that you can characterize and then sample from that class of programs to proves that there exist some algorithms that you can actually implement that have the properties of the optimal program. Mm -hmm. So we know the upper bound on how efficiently you can solve a task. So the first thing to say is that when you look at those algorithms, they're basically incomprehensible, at least the ones we could could find. Yeah. Yeah. So even for this relatively, from a computational perspective, relatively constrained sorting problem, Mm -hmm. The optimal algorithms that we could find were, yeah, you, you can't learn them, or at least we couldn't learn them. We haven't done systematic experiments on like trying to really make this work. I would like to do that. But the ones we found through our heuristic search program were like, just kind of, they seem like nonsense. Like they were just like, there was no order to what they were doing. So an important distinction is algorithms that solve the task through a set series of moves, mm-hmm. like collection sort, and algorithms that have conditionals in them. So You compare this pair of images, and if they swap, you then compare a different set of images. Mm -hmm. But if they don't swap, then you do something different. So if the algorithm has these conditionals in the program, Mm -hmm. then it can get really complicated really quickly and really kind of like... You have to track all the conditionals. Yeah, exactly. In fact, that was how we figured out the proof. So I collaborated with Bass, who was a co-first author on this. 
so he figured out the the proof by studying the like the trees, the ex possible execution traces for any algorithm from a specific set of initial conditions. And you can look at the trees, you can visualize the trees. It's kind of just a fun thing to do, and they're, they're really complicated. It's interesting. How close is gnome sort to the optimal? It's the closest thing we've found. We haven't found an interpretable algorithm that is any closer to the optimal program. I would be really curious, actually, if, if you could set up a problem where in the individual setting, nobody discovers the optimal algorithm mm. and then, or like the, the optimal interpretable algorithm. And okay. then, but in the transmissible setting, presumably somebody would be able to discover the optimal inter interpretable outcome. So maybe if the problem is more difficult or something like that, then it would be hard yeah. to not discover. Me too. Me too. That was the, yeah, that, that's something I would really like to find as well. So coming up with tasks that have the right trade-off of complexity and mm -hmm. tractability mm -hmm. is the whole game for these sorts of experiments. Consider other tasks when you were doing this at the time? Yeah, we thought about more complex sorting tasks, if I remember rightly. We thought about some other tasks that, um, the really important part of it was that we were able to characterize it computationally somehow to mm -hmm. be able to like characterize people's solutions, mm. the algorithmic structure of people's solutions. So counting is something else we thought about, I'm doing a little work on that at the moment, but in the early stages. You could imagine that there's a whole range of tasks you could use for experiments like this. I know someone is working on Rubik's cubes, uh, so people who aren't familiar with the known algorithms for Rubik's cubes. Interesting. And seeing how that gets developed. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's really interesting. Kind of stuff. Huh. After that, I know you recently worked on that in your postdoc, I guess recently mm -hmm. being a few years ago. Coming out of that, what are you exploring now? Well, a few things. So for context, I'm starting a lab. I'm, I just started as an assistant professor. I'm building a lab and, you know, creating a new research program. And uh, so like there's Congratulations. a bunch of dimensions of that. So I, I'm still very interested in those sorts of processes. I'd say my primary theoretical interest is how those sorts of cultural evolutionary processes can contribute to the complexity of cognition and mm. like to what extent things that we could think about as inherent cognitive processes mm. are actually products of cultural evolution in the way that observable material technologies are products of cultural evolution or languages are products of cultural evolution. That's the kind of same, same stuff we just talked about in the sorting experiment. Theorizing that idea is something I've been working on recently. What's nice about this space of problems is that you have mathematics from evolutionary biology mm -hmm. that helps you describe population level dynamics. And you have models from machine learning and, and like more classical psychological models that help you understand cognition, mm -hmm. learning and reasoning, mm -hmm. problem solving, sequential decision making. But they kind of don't talk to each other as well as you might like them to be able to. In the sense that when you try to model the process at the population level, you end up with something that looks like evolution. Mm -hmm. And when you try to model the pro the, the, what's happening by, at the individual level, you end up with something that looks more like learning. Yeah, so one of the things we've been working on is trying to integrate those two things and develop a way of thinking about cultural evolution as uh, distributed algorithmic processes or distributed computation. Thinking about population level processes as distributed computational processes gives you a way of viewing groups and multi-generational societies, in mm -hmm. a sense, simple societies, in the same terms that you can think about learning by individuals. So think about like something like a clock, for example. A clock is a piece of technology that with cognition in multiple ways, you know, it allows us to perform computations that would be maybe difficult without the device, kind of extends our capacity to reason about time. And if you think about the individual people who are designing clocks over the years and improving clocks, then we think about that as a form of intelligence, a form of cognition. It involves learning, reasoning, creativity, imagination, those sorts of things. But then if we think about the lineage of people over time who've designed clocks and worked on it, then the mathematics we have is mainly based around the evolutionary processes. Which is not generally something that's thought to be a cognitive process. But that's just a bunch of individuals, right? That's just somehow when you move from a single individual to a sequence of individuals, you have to change the mathematics you use to reason the process. So one advantage of thinking about population level processes as algorithms is that then you can think about the computations that go on in the individual cognition and the computations that are implied by distributed algorithms in the same terms. So 
for example, there are ways of thinking about social learning in populations as processes that instantiate distributed Bayesian inference. One of the ways of making that equivalence is through particle filtering algorithms. You know, uh, particle filtering algorithms at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're like sample-based approximation algorithms that are often used in Bayesian statistics. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it come from physics originally. One of the ideas behind that class of algorithms is that you can approximate complex computations through iterated sampling over time. Mm -hmm. so draw a bunch of samples from some distribution that you then use to approximate a function or to approximate a posterior distribution, for example. And then you can kind of compare them to the data and then keep some samples and throw some other samples away. Or there are much more complicated ways of choosing which samples to keep over time. Mm -hmm. And through this process of keeping and throwing away, you end up approximating the posterior much more efficiently. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the reason to mention those sorts of algorithms is to show that you can implement Bayesian inference or approximate Bayesian inference in this, um, way. In this kind of sequential, distributed, sample-based way. So the analogy there is that suppose you think about each person in a group as a sample, as or their, like the outcome of their thought process is a sample from a space of possible thinking processes. Mm -hmm. And then you think about the process of the transmission of knowledge over time as analogous to deciding which of the samples to keep and which to amplify and which not to keep. Then you can draw those connections and show that, yeah, you can you have something that looks at least approximately like sequence of social learners in a population that has the same structure, the same algorithmic structure as these distributed algorithms for Bayesian inference. So that's one equivalence that I like because you can think about a lot of the inductive challenges that people solve as inference problems. Mm -hmm. And then you can also think about cultural evolutionary process as in those same terms. This is really interesting. So the idea here, maybe like intuitively, I'm thinking of it as kind of cultural learning where the culture is analogous to the individual and there's some prior in the culture. And then through the sampling process and transmission process ends up being an approximation of some posterior. And that's kind of like the approximation, like the method of getting to the approximation is like a little bit different than in pure learning in a small individual. Yeah. It's a much better description than my description. No. Uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to explain. There's a lot of the richness of social learning and social cognition that is obviously not captured by this analogy, but it's a good place to start, I think, because it demonstrates that you can think about processes that happen over time, kind of accumulation of conceptual systems and knowledge and ideas in the same way that we can think about learning by individuals. And so I'm excited about that kind of integrative theory. One consequence of thinking about like distributed systems of knowledge accumulation in that way Mm -hmm. is that once you can think about them in computational terms, you can start to think about auxiliary processes that support or inhibit learning in the distributed computation. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. So that's where we started thinking about social networking algorithms. Um, so this mm -hmm. kind of perspective of thinking about processes of the accumulation of knowledge as distributed mm -hmm. computational processes mm -hmm. allows you to think about yeah things like algorithms that control the flow of information on social media ecosystems in the same terms. And say, okay, so this is hindering the accumulation of knowledge. And if you made this tweak here, then the, you know, that would improve things. What are some examples, if you have a sense of tweaks that you would make to hinder or improve the social learning? And in particular, I guess, I don't know if you can show this, but in particular, improve the accumulation of like acquisition of more complex concepts. Mm. I haven't thought about the acquisition of more complex stuff yet. That's a really interesting, a really interesting thing to think about. I agree. So I'm only getting started with thinking about social networking algorithms and other forms of designing computational technologies that can support diversity of ideas in a population and help solve some of the problems that social networking algorithms are causing, information <laughs> ecosystems. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're just getting started with simple stuff. Like, so we run really simple, like perceptual tasks where we ask people to decide, for example, are there more blue or green dots in an image that's kind of amb ambiguous. Uh, so the reason to start so simple is that we can characterize learning in those settings or the inductive inferences people make mm -hmm. really precisely and then measure the impact of a social networking algorithm on those sorts of judgments and decision-making tasks very precisely. It's kind of like a, it, it's just a way to get started. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. It makes me think, I mean, this is like a very imprecise 
thing I was about to say, but like science is an example of an algorithm that allows for this accumulation of mm. complex concepts over time in a social network. Like something about the way papers are published, cited, like without citations, it seems like we don't end with the same kind of accumulation. Like pop articles don't cite each other. And we kind of like end up rediscovering the same things or like Twitter doesn't cite itself very well. And so we end up rediscovering <laughs> things. So this like norm of kind of like pointing to old knowledge and where it came from and then like having to get something new in order to share it with other people is kind of interesting as an algorithm. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And thinking about it in those terms, at least for me, helps me think about designing experiments that can test those sorts of things and helps me think about designing stuff that can contribute to making that process is like more equitable, more effective, more productive discourse. There's a big gap between what we can do in the lab and with math and what can actually go out in the world and help real social media e ecosystems at the moment, but we're at least getting started and trying to work on closing that gap. Are there any other current projects that you want to talk about? So something I was thinking of talking about with you is quite unrelated to this stuff, or it, it is related. A lot of my work is about trying to understand how through social learning, we're exposed to the way other people think and how that helps us learn ways of thinking and reasoning. So kind of like externalizing thought processes and mm -hmm. observing them in other people can help transmit them over time and lead to the like construction of unlikely and powerful cognitive mechanisms. But I recently started thinking about it from the other perspective too. So what's like stuff that people aren't so exposed to through social learning? Like what about cognition? What aspects of cognition are people are kind of just stuck in our own heads and don't observe? Mm -hmm. I've become quite interested in this, just as like, I'm just getting started with this too, but one example is inner speech. Have you ever heard of inner speech? Yeah, you know, like inner monologue. Yeah, yeah. Do you have an inner monologue? I had more before I did a lot of therapy and now I have less. Ah, okay. Oh, uh, but I can, I can generate it. I can generate inner monologue, uh, ah, but it doesn't okay. pop up so much. Yeah. I love talking to people about inner speech and their particular experience of inner speech. Mm. So there's a whole literature on different kinds of inner speech and how frequent they are. So some people are constantly talking to, to themselves in, in their heads. Mm -hmm. Some people don't experience any inner speech at all. For some people, their inner speech is, is for example, evaluative, helps them like motivational or evaluative, critical. Mm -hmm. Some people, it's their voice. Some people, it's another person's voice. Mm -hmm. Some people, it's really rich and kind of full sentences and kind of a lot like external language use. Mm -hmm. Other people have what's known as condensed inner speech. So they're, they're definitely thinking in language, but it's kind of like compressing a, a lot of the signal you'd have to produce externally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's all this richness of variation in what people experience in inner speech. Like most of us have no idea about. It's kind of a surprise to find out that someone you've known for 10 years has no inner voice. And like I'm sat here talking to myself all the time. <laughs> you you talk to yourself all the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, for me, I have a very, very vivid inner speech. Oh, wow. Um, so interesting. Yeah, but it's not auditory for me. So for some people, it's very auditory. Oh, uh, wait. So what is it for you if it's not auditory? It's more like kinesthetic imagery, more like kind of imagining how I would say the words, but there's no sound coming out, you know, kind of like uh, suppressed huh. motor articulation, I guess is what's huh. kind of cool. interesting. But it's and not auditory. So you can kind of feel the talking, but it's not going through some auditory mechanism. It's kind of like speed reading or like when you're reading without subvocalization or something like that. Yeah, precisely. Or you understand the language, but it's not auditory. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It turns out reading is another area where there are these, what we're calling hidden phenomenal differences. I don't know if that phrase will be something we keep using, but it's what we're calling them right now or hidden differences in experience. Mm -hmm. So some people, when they read, have, again, very vivid reading voice in their heads. Other people, when they read, have don't articulate at all in their heads. And some people, it's their own voice that's reading. Some people have like a narrator's voice that they've learned. Some people, the voice that they hear when they read changes from setting to setting. Interesting. Yeah, so there's all this diversity out there in just how people think. Same with auditory imagery. Have you heard of aphantasia? Yeah, yeah. So I've been I've been asking everyone around me, especially everyone I work with, whether yeah. like kind of like what level of aphantasia they have. So my uh, co-founder, my co-founder has aphantasia, as well right. as some of the folks on our team. And it's very interesting. Like I've been trying to predict whether someone has like what level of aphantasia someone has based on their behavior. Oh. Uh, also based on the way that they think about problem. And interesting. It's really interesting. Have you been able to do that? I haven't studied the statistical significance of my <laughs> I'm not sure how significant they are, but it seems like 
I'm able to detect some people who definitely have aphantasia, as in they mm. don't have any pictures in their head. They mm. can't have pictures in their head. Maybe they have some spatial sense, but there are no pictures. The specific observation that causes this is I noticed that some people have a very kind of like sequential reasoning method. Something about the way that they're thinking about things is very, very orderly. Mm. And maybe this is a false correlation, but it seems correlated with aphantasia. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. So you're more prone to kind of sequential reasoning or like, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Whereas my reasoning is like certainly not sequential. It's like something, I'm not sure how to describe it, but it's not sequential. Just kind of arrives. <laughs> right. <laughs> it just arrives. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So I guess we should say for anyone who doesn't know what aphantasia is, it's the absence of visual imagery. Visual imagery is... You have the absence of visual imagery. I do, yeah. But we should say for anyone on the, uh, any of the listeners who've never heard the term before, I guess, the absence of visual imagery is aphantasia. Personally, I don't have any visual imagery at all. Um, Mm -hmm. It turns out that's the experience for a lot of people. Um, Mm, Interesting. And like you say, people are just kind of starting to learn about these differences now. Um, Mm -hmm. But when you think about them in combination with things like inner speech, things like, like how prone you are to like, Mathematical reasoning or stuff like that. At least the way it seems is that there's just a lot of richness and diversity in the way people think. Not just the things you think about, but how you think about them. So some people might have very vivid inner speech, but no visual imagery. People might be very visual, but not have much inner speech. So thinking about those sorts of differences, I think is really interesting and mm-hmm. uh, something I've been like thinking about working on a bit recently. It's really interesting. How would you go about tackling such a problem? Like do you ask people survey questions and then correlate with some behavior? Because that's all self-reported. So kind of what would you do? That's what people have done in the past. Part mm-hmm. of what makes this difficult to study is that it's by definition like phenomenological. Or like maybe that's not the right word. By definition, just your experience. Only your experience. Yeah. yeah. So yes, there are some good survey tools that have been like well calibrated, developed over time. Mm-hmm. That, you know, they have consistency within and between people mm-hmm. that measure things like visual imagery. There are also some ways of studying it that aren't just like self-report survey responses. Although self-report survey responses are also, uh, you know, really interesting. A lot of diversity in how people respond to it. And people can be quite confident about how they experience things like visual imagery. So there was a result recently, unfortunately, I don't remember the name of the paper, but people are using pupillometry to detect visual imagery. So I think, I mean, I'm just speaking from memory here, it's something that's not, not my work at all, but I think the result is that people who report more visual imagery, when they're asked to think about something that's bright, their pupils change more than people who have less visual imagery. Huh. So you can detect visual imagery through uh, the change of people's pupils. That's really interesting. Yeah. Huh. I think that's the result. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, feel free to write to me and let me know. But so stuff like that, people are coming up with really clever ways to measure inner experiences um, and also uh, neuroscientific methods, of course. Mm. Are there any measures of inner monologue? Mostly like just survey stuff, I think. Mm. People have tried to do some really like inventive, I think they call it experience sampling methods mm-hmm. to study inner speech. So rather than just asking people in general, do you talk to yourself? You can ask people to like carry a device with them that pings every I don't know, randomly every few hours. And the moment it pings, you have to say, what were you thinking about? And were you thinking in language? Or were you thinking this mm. other way? They're still mostly self-report, but they're more kind of embedded in people's lives and mm-hmm. momentary rather than generic questions. That makes sense. That's really interesting. Yeah, so I've been thinking about that kind of stuff recently and how that relates to like stuff that we learn socially. Yeah, what are your thoughts on how it relates? Still thinking about that. What makes it an exciting thing to study is precisely that people are so surprised to find out that other people do things differently. Mm, That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not a surprise. Like we know that some people like coffee and other people don't like coffee because you you can just see that, you know, you go for coffee with someone and you find out that they don't like tea, Mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. But we never really compare notes so much on things like your inner speech or your visual imagery. Yeah, that's actually quite interesting because it also feels to me that it is related to kind of like knowledge extraction from people because things we learn socially, we must be able to observe from others. And so we can't do social learning if the other person is not giving the knowledge in a way that we can observe it. 
And for things like inner experience, we don't do any, like it's not typical for us to share our inner experience in our culture. And so mm. it makes me wonder whether like there exist cultures where sharing of inner experience is much more, if, if there existed a culture in which sharing of inner experience is much more common mm. and there's more like kind of like knowledge Extraction is not quite the right word, but kind of yeah. like a way to get the knowledge out. Exchange, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exchange. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, then maybe you'd have different behaviors. I don't know. Or like more, less diversity. I don't know. Yeah, that's a very interesting idea that part of the, like one consequence of sharing the way you think is that it can function to reduce diversity. You were very interested in this question of kind of like, biological priors versus cultural learning. And then it seems like cultural learning allows for kind of this more general set of behaviors. I'm curious, like, what are things that you think the field is wrong about or that maybe you have like unusual opinions related to social learning? One of the ways I often start talks is by asking people to think a little about their ancestors. Even just a couple of generations ago, you know, 150 years ago, nobody knew how to write a computer program. Nobody even could conceive of a computer program. Mm -hmm. And that was just a couple of generations ago. Mm -hmm. Think a little further back, maybe 250 years ago, you know, four or five generations. I'm not sure if those numbers are right. Nobody knew how to drive a car or pilot an airplane. And then kind of extrapolate back a little further. Like, so let's jump really far. Let's go say, I don't know, 10,000 years in the past, mm -hmm. 50,000 years in the past. At some point, relatively recently, Nobody knew how to read. No one could write. There were no maps. There were no calendars. There were no all sorts of stuff that we have now that people didn't have then. And yeah, but like no one could solve a Rubik's Cube. Mm -hmm. No one could. At some point, we couldn't do CPR, for example. Mm -hmm. At some point, no one knew what, like even things that don't involve material technologies, like things that are just tools for thinking or ways of behaving. At some point in the relatively recent past, your ancestors didn't have that stuff. From a biological perspective, that's very, very short time scales. Mm -hmm. So 50,000 years ago, people had exactly the same brains as us. But things like driving, writing programs, writing music, you know, these are like things that we think about as core aspects of human intelligence. They're like the frontiers of artificial intelligence, trying to recreate those abilities. And we often think about them as distinctively human. But most of your ancestors that were anatomically modern humans with the same brains as ours had none of them, had yeah. actually completely different skill, cognitive abilities. So if you're a neuroscientist that time traveled back 50,000 years and take some of your equipment with you to start like, doing brain imaging and stuff, you would find that people were anatomically modern, as far as you know, you know same brains as ours. But you would have no idea that they could do things like write computer programs or fly a plane or who knows what things they could do that modern humans can't do, people now can't do. So I like thinking about those examples because what it says to me is that in order to understand the computational processes that give rise to things like complex learned algorithmic behaviors like driving or playing chess or solving a Rube cube or even language, speaking to each other. We need to have some way of reasoning about how knowledge accumulates across people. Mm. That's an important part of where, like the generative process for those sorts of cognitive abilities. That's the kind of motivating perspective that leads me to think about cultural evolution as something that's important for understanding cognition and trying to recreate some of that, right? So what would it take to build machine learning systems that develop conceptual systems that are productive over time and that lead to newer and newer conceptual systems that allow us to reason about new stuff. I think one interesting thing that it evokes for me is that AI systems don't have to transmit. You can just clone them and then mm. continue training. And so there's this interesting idea of kind of like in humans, the learning is distributed because we are individual agents. But mm. it means there's not really necessarily a such thing as individual agents. And so maybe like machines are the ultimate kind of like evolution as learning, like they're mm -hmm. the same in machines because you can clone. And it makes me wonder, like, I think it was Joseph Heinrich, The Secret of Our Success, or somebody wrote oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, indeed. yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody wrote about how it is actually important to have agents because they provide diversity. They kind of try new things and then they mm -hmm. 
bring that knowledge back. And somehow if you were not such, you didn't have this type of agent kind of bringing, trying new things, trying different things, then you wouldn't be able to discover nearly as quickly, or maybe you'd kind of get stuck just continuing to do the same behaviors. And it makes me wonder whether that is a purely human phenomenon or whether like machines will get stuck doing the same behaviors as well. If there's not like proliferation of maybe you clone the same agent, mm. they'll do a bunch of different things, but now the agents diverge and you need some way for them to recommunicate with each other. Mm. Like how important is that process in learning and the development of new concepts versus just like having a single cloned thing? Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's super fascinating. And we don't really have great answers to that yet. And what are the mechanisms we might design that recreate some of that? Yeah, some of those processes that maintain diversity and drive exploration, for example. So a couple of things to say. One is that part of the reason I'm interested in generation structured processes <laughs> is because a lot of the change in ideas seems to come from new generations. Mm -hmm, so, that's true. Uh, yeah, people, when they get old, they don't tend to change their minds too much. But as a society, we change by the young people, young people acquiring new ideas, so yeah. where a lot of change happens. I guess that's kind of what you're saying. Yeah. Are older people overfit? Oh, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I don't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually quite an interesting thing that change comes from new generations. Like seeing that observation, what does that make you think? So it makes me think that from a computational perspective, there's a couple of things going on maybe. So one is just preventing overfitting and the other is exploration. So not getting stuck in local solutions. And they're things we know how to deal well with in computational systems through regularization, balance of exploration and, and exploitation. It makes me think that we'll face those challenges. Something I've been thinking about recently in this kind of area of questions is um, so right now, what we have is monolithic systems that kind of get trained, especially with like language models, monolithic systems that are owned by a company. They get trained, they get frozen, and then mm -hmm. they get used. People mm -hmm. use them. But hopefully that's not the situation that we'll always be in. In the future, it's much more, well, I don't know if it's likely. I don't want to make a prediction, but one possible future is that we have something more like an ecosystem of intelligent agents. And the kind of like copy and paste or like retrain from scratch is not what people will want. So if you own a large language model that you've spent a lot of resource training and, and it's, you maybe have a distinctive training regime or training set, mm -hmm. you might want it to be able to interface with other systems, with other agents mm -hmm. and exchange knowledge without giving away everything. And that's part of what makes language so powerful for people. We don't just allow people access to our entire memories every time you want to have a conversation, you know, <laughs> we're quite selective in construing the knowledge that we share. Mm -hmm. And it's a, at least a possibility that in the, probably in the near future, we'll end up in more like an ecosystem of computational agents that have to solve these same questions of knowledge exchange. There's a hypothesis here, I think, underlying this, that there's some benefit from not seeing someone's entire brain. Like if we had a brain computer interface and I could like mm. get all of your memories and know exactly what you're saying, do you think that that would be detrimental in some way? I think so. I mean, so I, I don't work on brain to brain stuff, but mm -hmm. um, the perspective that I've been thinking about recently and reading other people writing about is more about the richness of what social interaction allows for people. So we can choose what to share. We can choose how to share. We can choose when to share. We can also choose how to construe stuff. So like we can do audience design. I can think about what you know and what would be most helpful, the most helpful way to construe my knowledge in a way that can help you. Mm -hmm. And that's not a limitation. Those are powerful things. Those are what allow us to maintain privacy as individual agents whilst sharing knowledge and accumulating knowledge over time. So maybe we'll start to face similar challenges in machine learning in the future. I don't know, it's a little outside my area, but if other people who, whose area that is closer to are interested, then I'd love to talk to people about that because mm -hmm. developing the math around sharing knowledge effectively and it, it is something I'm super interested in. Mm, that's awesome. That's really interesting. Do you have any intuitions about what are some bottlenecks to your field, like the kind of work that you do? What are the biggest bottlenecks? Yeah. One of the things that makes it challenging to study distributed intelligence experimentally is just creating the experimental paradigms. So in the past, that's been prohibitively challenging. We haven't been able to do that. Recently, we've got these new frameworks. So the one I use is called Dallinger. It's a 
platform for doing like full stack web development around complex experiments. Mm. Uh, but there are others as well. There's a, a really good one called Empirica that does a similar thing. There's kind of an ecosystem of software frameworks that are allowing us to run run more ambitious kind of like big science experiments in cognitive science. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, it's still really hard to do. So each one of those experiments, unless you're already like full stack web developer, is really hard for people to run. So making those technologies more accessible is mm -hmm. something I'm very interested in. Mm -hmm. And then having more full stack web developers in psychology labs. Yeah, or, yeah, training people in the parts of that that you need to be able to run those sorts of experiments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's one thing, just broadening access to the kinds of computational skills you need to be able to run big experiments. Mm -hmm. Another thing is obviously accessibility of language models and other like big new models. So as a psychologist interested in language and interested in machine learning, I would love to be able to start to understand why language models are able to do reasoning, why they're able to do stuff that we traditionally think of as, you know, at least something like thinking. Understanding what about the training process leads to those abilities. And as a cognitive scientist, I'm trained to prioritize understanding and experimentation. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel able to do those things with modern machine learning methods right now. And so I'm hoping that will change. What is blocking you from doing that? Just the scale, just like, so if, for example, if I want to look at how large language models learn to reason and something I would love to do is start to knock out parts of the training data set and say, okay, oh. when you knock uh -huh. this part of training data set out, like suddenly the reasoning capabilities go away or suddenly this aspect of your knowledge or this capacity to acquire structured algorithmic thinking disappears. Mm -hmm. Even just simple stuff like that is not tractable at the moment. Mm -hmm. I see. In terms of the cultural evolution work, Whose work do you feel like is really interesting? What ideas do you feel like are most interesting in that field? So the cultural evolution field is quite diverse and it's growing. There's a cultural evolution conference that attracts people from all different disciplines. It's really great. And a lot of people's work is really great there. But maybe what I'm personally most excited about is cognitive scientists becoming interested in these processes too. Mm -hmm. so personally, as someone who's interested in cognition, you know, mm -hmm. I work on like language and reasoning, creativity. So bringing some of the tools that we have from cognitive science to bear on questions of cultural evolution. Yeah, that's kind of a space I, I, I'm excited to see grow. Mm. When you say tools from cognitive science, do you mean mathematical tools or? Yeah, also just perspectives, just like people who have spent their lives thinking about learning, reasoning. The intersection of those two bodies of knowledge about how cultures evolve and how people learn, mm -hmm. I think it's a really exciting space. Earlier, you were asking, why is human cultural evolution so powerful and how do we accumulate these complex concepts over time? If you were to explain to your younger self what you've learned since then, what would you say to your younger self? Interesting question. Never thought about that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a couple of things. Part of what has made my work more enjoyable and better able to connect with other people mm -hmm. is doing experimental research. So. Doing experimental work allows me to connect with a broader range of communities than doing mathematical work and to doing just mathematical work or computational work. So the trajectory uh, for me has been one of taking a perspective that I learned around language. So mm -hmm. thinking about how languages evolve culturally and how something like language has emerged in, in our species mm -hmm. and using the tools of cultural evolution to think about that problem. Mm -hmm. The trajectory for me has been taking that perspective and applying it to other aspects of cognition too, and seeing how it can apply more broadly than just communication systems. Understanding how things like planning or reasoning or yeah, learning, yeah, creativity, even learning, understanding how things like that are also shaped by cultural evolutionary processes has been the kind of trajectory I've been on with my own research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so generalizing the perspective from one particular ability to try to create something that can account for other cognitive processes too. I would also tell myself to study neural networks earlier. <laughs> Why? Just because when I was doing my PhD, it wasn't clear that they were going to be so influential. Mm, I see. And now they're interesting and helpful yeah. as models. Yeah, exactly. Are they helpful as models or are they helpful for things? Both. We use neural networks to just characterize the structure and behavior in large data sets or characterize the structure and behavior that we can't write down in more interpretable models. So we're using them as a tool just to classify and to capture structure, mm -hmm. but also as a model. 
especially as deep learning connects to sequential decision making and the abilities that depend on that. So like planning, reasoning, social interaction, um, these aspects of human cognition that can be thought of as forms of sequential decision making. Uh, understanding those abilities from a computational perspective with the tools we've got from deep learning now mm -hmm. is really insightful. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is really fun and really interesting. Very different than the normal person we talk to, which is awesome. Okay, great. I feel like I've learned a lot about how learning happens in a distributed way and like the importance of it. Great. Thanks for inviting me. I, I, it was great fun to talk. Thanks for listening to the Generally Intelligent Podcast. If you like this, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review on Apple Podcast. On Twitter, I'm at Kenjun, K-A-N-J-U-N. And our lab is at Gen Intelligent. Until next time.